Thomas Sh Thomas shared a bunk with Minho, who insisted on sleeping up top. Newt and Fry Pan were right next to them. The staff put Teresa up in a separate room, shuffling her away before she could even say goodbye. Thomas missed her desperately three seconds after she was gone. As Thomas was settling into the soft mattress for the night, he was interrupted. Hey, Thomas, Minho said from above him. Yeah, Thomas was so tired the word barely came out. What do you think happened to the gladers who stayed behind? Thomas hadn't thought about it. His mind had been occupied with Chuck and now Teresa. I don't know, but based on how many of us died getting here, I wouldn't like to be one of them right now. Grievers are probably swarming all over them. He couldn't believe how nonchalant his voice sounded as he said it. You think we are safe with these people? Minho asked. Thomas pondered the question for a moment. There was only one answer to hold on to. Yeah, I think we are safe. Minho said something else, but Thomas didn't hear. Exhaustion consuming him. His mind wandered to his short time in the maze, his time as a runner and how much he'd wanted it ever since that first night in the glade. It felt like a hundred years ago. Like a dream. Murmurs of conversation floated through the room, but to Thomas they seemed to come from another world. He stared at the crossed wooden boards of the bed above him, feeling the pull of sleep. But wanting to talk to Teresa, he fought it off. How's your room? He asked in his mind. Wish you were in here. Oh, yeah? She replied. With all those stinky boys. Think not. Guess you're right. I think Minho's farted three times in the last minute. Thomas knew it was a lame attempt at a joke, but it was the best he could do. He sensed her laughing, wished he could do the same. There was a long pause. I'm really sorry about Chuck, she finally... The next hour or so was a blur of sights and sounds for Thomas. The driver drove at reckless speeds through towns and cities, the heavy rain obscuring most of the view. Lights and buildings were warped and watery, like something out of a drug-induced hallucination. At one point people outside rushed to the bus, their clothes ratty, hair matted to their heads. Strange sores like those Thomas had seen on the woman covering their terrified faces. They pounded on the sides of the vehicle as if they wanted to get on. Wanted to escape whatever horrible lives they were living. The bus never slowed. Teresa remained silent next to Thomas. He finally got up enough nerve to speak to the woman sitting across the aisle. What's going on? He asked, not sure how else to pose it. The woman looked over at him. Wet black hair hung in strings around her face. Dark eyes full of sorrow. That's a very long story. The woman's voice came out much kinder than Thomas had expected, giving him hope that she truly was a friend, that all of their rescuers were friends. Despite the fact that they'd run over a woman in cold blood. Please, Teresa said, please tell us something. The woman looked back and forth between Thomas and Teresa, then let out a sigh. It'll take a while before you get your memories back, if ever, we're not scientists, we have no idea what they did to you, or how they did it. Thomas's heart dropped at the thought of maybe having lost his memory forever, but he pressed on. Who are they? he asked. It started with the sun flares, the woman said, her gaze growing distant. What? Teresa began, but Thomas shushed her. Just let her talk, he said to her mind. She looks like she will. Okay. The woman almost seemed in a trance as she spoke, never taking her eyes off an indistinct spot in the distance. The sun flares couldn't have been predicted. Sun flares are normal, but these were unprecedented, massive, spiking higher and He finally pulled it all back into his heart, sucking in the painful tide of his misery. In the glade, Chuck had become a symbol for him, a beacon that somehow they could make everything right again in the world. Sleep in beds. Get kissed goodnight. Have bacon and eggs for breakfast. Go to a real school. Be happy. But now Chuck was gone. 
and his limp body, to which Thomas still clung, seemed a cold talisman that not only would those dreams of a hopeful future never come to pass, but that life had never been that way in the first place. That even in escape, dreary days lay ahead. A life of sorrow. His returning memories were sketchy at best, but not much good floated in the muck. Thomas reeled in the pain, locked it somewhere deep inside him. He did it for Teresa, for Newt and Minho. Whatever darkness awaited them, they'd be together. And that was all that mattered right then. He let go of Chuck, slumped backward, trying not to look at the boy's shirt black with blood. He wiped the tears from his cheeks, rubbed his eyes, thinking he should be embarrassed but not feeling that way. Finally, he looked up. Looked up at Teresa in her enormous blue eyes, heavy with sadness, just as much for him as for Chuck. He was sure of it. She reached down, grabbed his hand, helped him stand. Once he was up, she didn't let go, and neither did he. He squeezed, tried to say what he felt by doing so. No one else said a word, most of them staring at Chuck's body without expression, as if they'd moved far beyond feeling. No one looked at Galley, breathing but still. The woman from Wicked broke the silence. All things happen for a purpose, she said, any sign of malice now gone from her voice. You must understand this. Thomas looked at her, threw all his compressed hatred into the glare. But he did nothing. Teresa placed her other hand on his arm, gripped his bicep. What now? she asked. I don't know, he replied. I can't, his sentence was cut short by a sudden series of shouts and commotion outside the entrance through which the woman had come. She visibly panicked the blood draining from her face as Thomas took a step backward, noticing others doing the same. A deathly silence sicked the life out of the air as every last glader stared at the row of windows, at the row of observers. Thomas watched one of them look down to write something, another reach up and put on a pair of glasses. They all wore black coats over white shirts. A word stitched on their right breast, he couldn't quite make out what it said. None of them wore any kind of discernible facial expression, they were all sallow and gaunt, miserably sad to look upon. They continued to stare at the gladers, a man shook his head, a woman nodded. Another man reached up and scratched his nose, the most human thing Thomas had seen any of them do. Who are those people? Chuck whispered, but his voice echoed throughout the chamber with a raspy edge. The creators. Minho said, then he spat on the floor. I'm gonna break your faces, he screamed, so loudly Thomas almost held his hands over his ears. What do we do? Thomas asked. What are they waiting on? They've probably rev the grievers back up, Newt said. They're probably coming right. A loud, slow beeping sound cut him off. Like the warning alarm of a huge truck driving in reverse, but much more powerful. It came from everywhere, booming and echoing throughout the chamber. What now? Chuck asked, not hiding the concern in his voice. For some reason everyone looked at Thomas, he shrugged in answer, he'd only remembered so much, and now he was just as clueless as anyone else. And scared. He craned his neck as he scanned the place top to bottom, trying to find the source of the beeps. But nothing had changed. Then out of the corner of his eye, he noticed the other gladers looking in the direction of the doors. He did as well, his heart quickened when he saw that one of the doors was swinging open toward them. The beeping stopped, and a silence as deep as outer space settled on the chamber. Thomas waited without breathing, braced himself for something horrible to come flying through. Almost at once the grievers had shut down completely, their instruments sicked back through their blubbery skin, their lights turned off, their inside machines dead quiet. In that door, Thomas fell to the floor after being released by his captor's claws, and despite the pain of several lacerations across his back and shoulders, elation surged through him so strongly he didn't know how to react. He gasped then laughed then choked on a sob before laughing again. 
Chakra had scooted away from the grievers. Bumping into Teresa, she held him tightly, squeezing him in a fierce hug. You did it, Chuck, Teresa said. We were so worried about the stupid code words. We didn't think to look around for something to push the last word, the last piece of the puzzle. Thomas laughed again, in disbelief that such a thing could be possible so soon after what they'd gone through. She's right, Chuck, you saved us, man. I told you we needed you. Thomas scrambled to his feet and joined the other two in a group hug, almost delirious. Chuck's a shocking hero. What about the others? Teresa said with a no toward the griever hole. Thomas felt his elation wither, and he stepped back and turned toward the hole. As if in answer to her question, someone fell through the black square. It was Minho, looking as if he'd been scratched or stabbed on 90% of his body. Minho, Thomas shouted, filled with relief. Are you okay? What about everybody else? Minho stumbled toward the curved wall of the tunnel, then leaned there, gulping big breaths. We lost a ton of people. It's a mess of blood up there, then they all just shut down. He paused, taking in a really deep breath and letting it go in a rush of air. You did it. I can't believe it actually worked. Newt came through then, followed by Frypan, then Winston and others. Before long, 18 boys had joined Thomas and his friends in the tunnel making a total of 21 gladers in all. Every last one of those who'd stayed behind and fought was covered in griever sludge and human blood, their clothes ripped to shreds. The rest? Thomas asked, terrified of the answer. Half of us, Newt said, his voice weak. Dead.